how to govern your mouth by God's word. Amen. As is our custom here at St. Matthew's, as every church does across the nation, we begin our year in consecration. In consecration, we set ourselves apart to dedicate ourselves to holiness, to seeking God and his will for us through prayer, meditation, and fasting. We begin the year in such a way to again seek God for direction, disengage from the baggage of the previous year, and to get a spiritual reset toward a fresh start. We consecrated under the banner this year, uh, the year of still more. God wants to minister to you, mature you, and move you. And it was based out of Ephesians 3.20. Now, I'm going to be picking up a lot of things that we have done in the past because oftentimes we have these pivotal moments. We have these good times in the word, and then we glaze right over it. We forget about it. And God wants us to connect the dots because there's nothing that we do here that is wasteful. And the way you begin in January with that fresh restart, you should be able to carry through till the next January. So hopefully we didn't go through a futile time of fasting and consecration because if we did, it would have all been in vain. Now, what was unique about consecration this year for 2022 that we, in addition to putting our bellies on a fast, we put our mouths on a fast. Do you remember that? We were to consecrate from complaining. And as we go further in this word, we're going to see just how prophetic our pastor was being when, he, when the, he allowed the Lord to download in him, consecrate the mouth, consecrate the mouth, fast from complaining. Our pastor has designated the beginning of the year uh, uh, as the season, the appointed time to set apart. Now, for the sake of clarity, I want to define what a season is. Sometimes we have language in Christianity. We have language in church. And again, we get on automatic pilot because we see it for so long. And I know with me being a Christian over 30 years, there, there are some things that I've heard but never connected to because no one ever made it clear. No one has ever gave a definition. It was like just the latest thing that Christians say. But I want you to come away with some tools. I want you to be Christians, like our pastor has uh, mentioned a few weeks ago. I want you to be able to put the emphasis in your faith where it belongs, on Christ. On Christ. And when we say Christian, sometimes we just fly, fl just fly by Christian. Well, I don't know who Chris is, but I know who Christ is. And that's what my identity is rooted in, Christ. So what is a season? It is a period of the year marked by certain conditions, activities. It's when certain things are available and it's characterized by a certain climate. It's characterized by a certain climate or atmosphere. There are seasons in nature, winter, spring, summer, and fall. There are personal seasons. Some of us women, we know we have a personal season, right? Uh, <laughs> there's the seasons of adolescence and childhood and, and college age and, 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 and different things that we develop through. And there are seasons on a calendar and there are spiritual seasons. They're spiritual seasons. Yes, God has a season. He has an appointed time. As we read that passage in Ecclesiastes 1, verses 1 through 8, he outlines there's a time for everything. Now, though the Lord exists outside of time, he has given us both chronos, meaning chronological time, 
and uh, to govern ourselves and to give us boundaries. And then he has given us Kairos time. Now that's the time where he steps in and breaks, breaks in our monotony. He steps into our time frame. It's the opportune time. It's, it's when that, that thing comes together and when all things in your life are right. It's when that door of opportunity opens and right then and there, you got to walk through it. It's the time that's meant for you. God wants us to be cognizant and discerning of the times and seasons. First Chronicles 12, 32, it is said uh, about the sons of Issachar that they understood the times and knew what Israel should do. They understood the times. And I want you to take note of that. First Chronicles 12, 32. All right. I want you to take note of that because just like, uh, the sons of Issachar, there is something to be said about knowing what season you're in. There is something to be said about knowing what season you are in. Because when you know what season you're in, you know how to conduct yourself. You know how to prepare yourself. You know how to get dressed. You know how to get dressed for the winter. You know how to get dressed for the summer. You don't put on a, a fur coat in the summertime. That may be ready to call 211 psychological services on you when you go walking out with the big mink coat in July. We also need to know the spiritual seasons. We also need to know how to get dressed spiritually. When you're in a season of warfare, you don't kick back like it's a season for you to be at the beach. You've got to have your hands up and your head down. <laughs> you got to know how to get dressed. You got to know how to have, when to have that helmet on. You got to know how to have that breastplate on. You got to know what to have them shoes on. You got to know when to draw that sword. Understanding the seasons. So just as it is said for the sons of Issachar, I believe that God wants the same set of us as the sons of God. Do you know your sonship? See, that has nothing to do with gender. The sons of God has to do with your position. It has to do with the fact that you are an heir. It has to do with the fact that you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. It has to do with the fact that you represent the kingdom of God. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. You are a son. You are an heir. And see, we just sung speaking to the atmosphere. I want you to know that's more than a song. That's your right. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's your right. And you do yourself a disservice if you come in here and sing the song and never speak to the atmosphere of your life. You punk yourself if you come in here and sing and never speak to the atmosphere of your life. When you leave here and don't recognize that you are a son. Leaving here acting like you are an illegitimate child. Hmm. That was a sila right there. In fact, we are in the midst of one of the greatest seasons on God's calendar. We are in the midst of the 50 day period between Passover, which we call Resurrection Sunday, and we kind of moved from Easter, and Pentecost. And if we relegate this time to just a day as dictated by our traditions, which can be quite carnal, we will miss the spiritual weightiness of the season and we won't 
know what to do. See, our faith is, is probably only faith that has gotten commercialized, that has gotten dumbed down, it has gotten hijacked by Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and Easter eggs and Elf on the Shelf. And we miss the gravity of what God did. So let me tell you a little bit about what happened. Now, uh, what we was calling Easter, Easter is really Passover. On God's calendar, it's marked as Passover. It's the time uh, when in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were coming out of bondage, they, and you know the story, after the 10th plague, they had to get a lamb. The 10th tenth, the tenth plague was taking the life of the eldest uh, child. Uh, they had to get a lamb, drain the blood, put the blood on the doorposts and the lentils, right? The side and the top. They had to get unleavened bread because leaven represented sin. God said, take all the leaven out of your house. There were certain days that they had to do this. Now he said, eat this meal real quick. Because even though you've been waiting for your deliverance for a long time, when it comes, it's going to come quick. I want you to have your shoes on. I want you to be girded up. I want you to have your, your clothes tucked in your belt. You got to eat standing up and get ready to go. Because you about to be free. Okay. Now this right here is Old Testament, but we know that uh, Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals. So we're going to fast forward to the other side of the cross and we know Jesus is our Passover lamb. And we know that his blood had been shed on the lentils, the doorposts, which is the, hor the horizontal of the cross and the vertical of the cross. Now, when they did that over their house, Put, putting the blood over their house, they had to stay in the house until the death angel passed, and that's why it's called Passover. Fast forwarding, as we have the blood over our lives, take the leaven out of your life. Stay in the house. Don't come from under the blood. Hmm. See, there's a hijacked message about grace. And there's a thing in the world that says, well, you know, God know my heart. I'm under grace, blah, blah, blah. Well, we do have grace. But grace is not to partner with you in doing sin. Grace is to empower you unto righteousness. Grace gives you the strength and the wisdom and the capability to walk in unity with God. Grace gives you the strength to stay in the house. That's what grace is. Grace will never uh, empower you to lie, steal, fornicate, cheat. Come on now. We got to expose it before we expel it. And this ain't to point no finger at nobody. But I want to, I want to strengthen you because as we expose and expel, we establish truth and then we expect. Come on y'all. So Psalm 90 is the time when, uh, Moses was in the wilderness. They were in between Passover or the time of their deliverance and the time going to their promise. Just like now in the New Testament, we are, are in that time where Jesus went on the cross. He delivered us. And then for 40 days after the resurrection, he appeared. He did many miracles. And then 10 days later, the 50 days came Pentecost. That is our promise, the promise of the spirit. Now, we are on the other side of that, and we have it. That's what makes you sons. You have the promise. You have the power of Holy Spirit. You have Pentecost. It has come. 
It has come. That's why you can speak into the atmosphere. That's why you can declare. You don't have to beg for nothing because you have it. <laughs> but when you don't know what time it is and when you don't know what season you're living in, you will not draw upon your account. You will not draw upon what you already have. And that's what the children of Israel did in the wilderness. They didn't know. They, they, the wilderness really tried and tested them. And they didn't know what they had. They didn't know what they were going to. They lost sight of what they were going to. So Moses is attributed to this psalm. It is the fourth division of psalms that talks about man's sojourn and journey through life. He penned it in the wilderness. And it was after he lost his, his sister Miriam. She died. His, his brother um, Aaron died. The people were grumbling. They said, man, Moses, you're supposed to be the big deliverer. You brought us out here in the middle of the wilderness. We want to go back to Egypt because we had food when we was in Egypt. Not recognizing that as they were in the wilderness journeying, they walked for 40 years, their shoes didn't even wear out. They had everything they wanted, but the wilderness was a time of testing. Yes, the wilderness is a time of testing. And because of this, they, they at this time, because they were losing sight of what God was doing, it exposed what was in their heart and they began to grumble, complain and murmur. The word says murmur and complain. Moses, he had to sit down and start writing. He had to, he had to write down that prayer. Because he said, I think I'm going to need to go back to this one. So he penned this prayer. I want you to think about where we are today as a church. The season that we're in as a church. And as as e even uh, in the natural, the season where we are, what's been happening in the past couple of years. It has been a time of trying. It has been a time of testing. It has been a time of loss. It has been a time that will cause us to question God. It, it, it is a time that, you know, a whole bunch of stuff is not adding up, God. I mean, you know, hey, 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 hey. Your word is, is, is your word has all these promises. It, it's supposed to, I'm supposed to be in the land of Goshen. I'm supposed to be untouched by some things but God some stuff have touched me and I'm confused about this it, it's touching me right now and it hurt it hurt but it squeezes what it, 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 it reveals to us when you find yourself talking this way it reveals to you what actually is in your heart oh born again believer So let me give you a definition again about what it means to complain and what it means to murmur. To complain, when you research this in the Strong's Concordance, it means to wrangle. It means to grapple. It means to hold controversy in your heart. Hold. When you complain, you hold. You hold stuff in your heart. So, so you think you're venting. You think you're getting it out. But you're not. It's what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. Now, it, it don't feel good right now. It may feel like I'm, I'm really like great, uh, scraping you with a, a scouring pad or something. But I'm really not. I'm helping you. It's going to get good. What does it mean to murmur? Now, this is a big one. This is a big one. Because I'm telling y'all this because I've been there. And maybe I just got out of it on Tuesday. You know? <laughs> I had to get out real quick before I preach. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank God for a sense of humor. Laughter does good like a medicine. I, ha I had to come out so I could preach. 
Hallelujah. So murmur, it means to stop. You ever wonder why you stuck? Murmur means to stop. It means to stay permanently. It means to linger in a place too long. Now, I, I didn't get this out the dictionary. I, I got this out of the Strong's Concordance. I went to find out what the original word was in the Bible. Moses, what was you talking about when you said the people complained? What was you talking about when you said the people murmured? Because, see, we in the, today, we use words for everything, and they really have no meaning. But just because they stop having meaning with us, they don't stop having meaning in the atmosphere. So it means to linger and stay in a place too long. It means to be obstinate. And again, it means to hold, hold a grudge. To hold a grudge. The wilderness tests and reveals what's in the heart. It will either bring out the best in you or the worst in you. Proverbs 6 and 2 says, you have, sna you have been snared by the words of your mouth, trapped by the words from your mouth. Now, in the context of this scripture, when you go to Proverbs chapter 6, start from verse 1. Because you will find that it is talking about a binding legal contract. So what does this tell us about the words coming out of our mouths? That our words are binding legal contracts. They may have meant nothing to you, but God has a standard for his word. He, and, and I'm not talking about the biblical word only. I'm talking about the very nature and purpose and function of words. Period. Why do you think unsaved people, when they get a determination in their mind and they want to do something, they will get vision boards, they will get journals, they get a determination, and they will speak it, they will say what they want, don't know that they are following biblical principles, don't care if they're following biblical principles, they will do the biblical principle and it will come to pass. But as Christians, for some reason, we got hijacked of our rights and we get reckless with our mouth. And we live in the recklessness that we have created. Words create, period. Words create, period. You are made in the image and likeness of God. And let me tell you something. That just doesn't mean church people. Humanity is made in the image and likeness of God. That's why they can use the biblical principles. A principle is a principle. No matter what. Try to jump off of a building. With your saved self. And see if the principle of gravity won't work. Try it. Satan tried to hijack Jesus out of that. He tried to make Jesus get up there and jump. But because Jesus was fully God and fully human, he said, I'm not going to lead my people into foolishness, for I am their example, and I'm and instead am going to come at Satan with a word instead of jumping. Because even though he could have jumped, and not hit the ground and defy gravity. He wanted us to operate in this world as fully anointed humans. Christians. He didn't want you to live foolish. He wanted you to live wise. Teach us to number our days. That we would apply wisdom to our hearts. Let me read it out of the uh, Passion Translation, and it's really, really good out of that translation, but it reads like this. Psalm 90, verse 12. Help us to remember that our days are numbered 
and help us to interpret our lives correctly. So your wi- set your wisdom deeply in our hearts so that we may accept your correction. Hey, God. Words are never empty. Words are containers that carry thought, ideas, power. They create, they have direction, they define destiny. Words sanctify, words bless. And as we have seen, words can defile. Now, what words defile? Now, again, I have another definition for you. What does it mean to be defiled? It means to pollute or contaminate. You contaminate your spirit. You contaminate other people's lives. You contaminate the workplace. You contaminate the meeting. You be profane. What does it mean to profane? That means to have irreverence or contempt for the holy things of God. So again, if you want them people that feel like, look, I don't have to be so holy that I'm, I just keep it real. I just be me. And you still cuss like a sailor. Help me, Jesus. You defile your spirit. And you set up profane contracts in your life. Oh, yes. (laughs) Thank you, cuz. (laughs) words are spiritual they are spiritual in nature and substance that's why the bible says faith is the substance because you express your faith with your words it's substance substance is stuff they originate from the heart and that's why they're so powerful the heart is the spirit of man and then words go to the heart They leave your heart and it's like they have a homing device because they're looking for ground to land in and the ground that they land in is in the heart. The heart is the center of your being. It's the hub. It's where everything happens. It's where you do life. Yeah. So when we get uh, derailed, which, is, which can happen when we're speaking words that are outside of the character of who we are as Christians, we stay in the wilderness, wandering around, aimlessly stuck, staying in a place too long, holding a grudge in your heart. When we get derailed, we get out of step with productive rhythms of life. We get out of alignment with God and the rhythm of his kingdom. You are not earthbound. You are kingdom bound. When you said yes to the Lord, your address changed from the kingdom of darkness really to the kingdom of light. You are connected to the kingdom of God. And because you are connected to the king, you are connected to the place where he li- He has a kingdom. You are here as a representative, as a son, as an heir. And as a representative, you have power in your mouth. And what you're supposed to do with that power, according to Corinthians, is to reconcile all things to him. Meaning bring things back to him. Give me a few more minutes. I'm going to bind that sleepy spirit and that hot sluggishness because I, I need y'all. I, I need your spirit to be awake 
That's, that's why the church is in trouble because the church is sluggish. And our capacity for things that are not traditional is very small. But Elder Patterson started out the service with saying, I'm going to read something that's not traditional, Mother's Day. So don't miss your season while you're in this wilderness. Don't miss your season. The whole globe went into a wilderness experience. So beware not to fall out of alignment with God. Psalm 141 and 3. Lord, set up a guard for my mouth. Keep watch at the door of my lips. What does your mama tell you when you start talking sassy? Watch your mouth. We need the guard. We need the guard. I'm almost through. So we have to remember the season that we're in. Don't you see, see what we did was even though we call it resurrection Sunday in our mind, it was still Easter because some of y'all still went out and got some Easter clothes. Look, I'm not mad. And you, and you did the whole Easter thing for your kids. I used to do it for mine too. It was fun. But then you, you, you just, it was just another Sunday and then, and then you left it. But really, if you want to draw from the power that is ours and the power of the season, you'll recognize that the greatest deliverance in history took place during this time. It is something on the natural calendar and the spiritual calendar. And the, the, the words in this Bible, he said, is spirit and life. These are not just Bible stories. This is not like a giant Hallmark card. So what am I telling you? We're still on that calendar. If there are some things that are tied up in your life, if there's some deliverances that you need, this is the season. Remember I talked about Kairos, the opportune time. You are in a Kairos moment for your deliverance. Begin to make withdrawals from the kingdom. Remind Satan that he's a trespasser. That the leaven has been removed from your life. That you have been delivered. You went through the Red Sea and you are in the land of promise right now. Because, see, he banks on the fact that we don't know. Most of my worst moments in Christianity as a saved, born-again believer, loving God, was because I did not know what was mine. And I let him jack me out of my promises. Come on, y'all. So use this season. Go back and read the word. Find out what is that, what was that preacher talking about? I want to see this stuff that she was talking about. Do you know one of the things that we don't focus on, and I heard somebody mention this, and it's right there in the scripture, that during resurrection, when Jesus got up, 500 people came out the grave. They came out. So what's keeping you bound? The power was spilling over. It's in the gospel accounts. He got up. And we say all the time, he got up, so I got up. He got up and 500 dead folk got up. And we don't know how long they've been in the ground. Then before he ascended, he hung around for 40 days and said, see, I told you so. See, I told you so. I told you I was going to do this. Uh, he, met, he met one of them on the beach and had a fish sandwich. He, he, he told you. <laughs> By many infallible proofs. Then he ascended. He went up and put the blood on the mercy seat. And he gave us gifts. 
he was just, just, just get that in your holy imagination. He going up. He was like, I, I spent 40 days now. I, I, I convinced him. I came back. I showed him. Now I'm going to go up and I'm just opening up myself. Pour myself over the universe. Give gifts to my church. Then I'm going to have him wait for me in the upper room. And I'm going to pour out the big gift. Can't nobody mess with them. And they're going to be able to do what I did. They're going to be able to say what I said. Oh, God. They're going to be able to speak with new tongues. Now, if you're too Baptist and this is bothering you, please get in your prayer closet at home and say, God, I want to get that Holy Ghost thing. I want to speak with new tongues. Because, see, he begins to orchestrate stuff in the spirit because everything we don't know to pray about. So he gives us divine mysteries and secrets that we can speak. This is our God. This is the season that we're in. This is a time. Um, now, so, okay, I'm, I'm going to something else. This is a time on God's calendar where he calls this month. I know we call it May. But on his calendar, he calls it IR. And it's a time of revelation. It's a time of waiting. Remember when Pastor last week was talking about uh, waiting? And he said, when you, when you see something, say something. He talked about how you wait. Well, it's still true. During this time, it's important how you wait. Because, see, we're, we're, in, the, we're in the midst of the deliverance and the promise. So it's how you wait. It's what you say when you wait. It's what you say when you find yourself in a wilderness. He wants to reveal secrets to you. He wants to give you the answer. Did you hear me? He wants to give you the answer. He wants to pour into you. He wants to heal you. He wants to mend your brokenness. He wants to untie you. He wants to pour the salve into you. Now we can either be still in the wilderness and know that he is God, or we can grumble and complain and miss it. And say, okay, I had Easter, now it's Mother's Day. I'm getting ready to go have my picnic in June. I'm getting ready to get out in June. Fourth of July coming. You out of step. Out of, and they, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm a pro at being untimely and out of step. So, you know, God is funny. He'll use somebody who's real good at being untimely to come and tell you about his timeliness. Because I'm getting tired of being out of step. So let me give you another definition. Alignment. Alignment. I, I, look, I know I've been up here for a little while. Just give me seven more minutes. Alignment. Alignment is a state of agreement or cooperation among persons, groups, nations that have the same a common viewpoint. We want to get a common viewpoint with our God. We want to, look, this is real good. We want to get a common viewpoint about what he said about us. We want to get a common viewpoint about what he said about us because most of us don't know what he said about us. Most of us don't know, nor do we believe what he said or how he feels about us. Because somebody told you you was a sinner saved by grace. And that ain't hardly true. You're born again. You're born again. You're made new. You're regenerated. So, I'm going to tell you one more thing about this season, all right, that's on the Jewish calendar. With 2020, we feel like we entered a real big messy time, right, with the, with the COVID. But what we really entered in in the spirit was the decade of the mouth. The decade of the mouth. The decade of pay, the decade of the mouth. It is the decade that God has set 
in his divine timing where your mouth, your tongue will be restored. See, that's why I told y'all to hang in there. The time that you invested will not, look, this is, this, this is an investment. You're, you're sowing. So stay awake. Because you're going to reap. You're going to reap from this time that you invested, that you sold in service today. It is the decade of the mouth. It means that your mouth has been restored, that you have the authority to speak into the atmosphere, that we have the authority to declare, that we have the authority to, rede- to, um, to speak words of redemption, to reconcile and realign the decade of the mouth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So come on, let's stand up and worship because we're going to prophesy right now. We're going to prophesy. Do you know that you all can prophesy? The word prophesy, now there's some different dimensions of prophesy. There are those who foretell and uh, have territory over nations and, and, you know, that kind of prophesy, yea, the Lord, and all that kind of stuff that we, but prophesy really means, the word really means to encourage. It means to say what God has said. That's what a decree is. So you even have to be careful with your decrees. You can't say what you want. You, you can't say, uh, uh, you know, I, I want that car. Like there's no basis in it, but you say what God has said. You decree what has already been decreed. And how do you find out that? It's in the word. It's in the word. Bishop Gay used to say this word right here is the greatest prophecy. You have that at your disposal. So we're going to prophesy right now. We're going to prophesy into this season and we're going to withdraw what is ours as children of God. We're going to withdraw what is ours as sons and as heirs. And you're going to do it with your mouth. Holly, that's the tool. That's the strategy. That's the strategy. Hallelujah. So I'm just going to take some time to pray. Ah, God, y'all, y'all just lift your hands and meditate. If you have a prayer language, use it. If you don't, don't get bound up. Just come on with me. Because see, we're getting into the atmosphere. We're stepping into what already has been set. God, I thank you. God, I bless you. God, I honor you. You can do that. Hallelujah to Jesus. I bless your name. God, you're beautiful. You're wonderful. You're good. You are merciful. God, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you put the blood on the mercy seat for me. Oh, God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Father, you declare that in everything I am to give thanks, for this is your will concerning me and Christ Jesus. And right now, God, we're getting into your will. We're getting into what, what, what you are concerned about in regards to us. Hallelujah to Jesus. Oh, God. So we're going to begin to repent. If you can say it, I'm going to say it clear. You can say it after me. And if you want to just listen, say it in your heart. Here we go. God, we repent for our misalignment with your season. We sever ungodly contracts made with our mouth. We set our mouth in agreement with you, your season, and your will for us. In this season, we decree and declare an outpouring of your spirit upon our lives. We posture our hearts to receive a fresh revelation of your word. Hallelujah to Jesus. Come on, give God glory. Come on, give God glory. Now, if 
if you don't remember and you can't hear, go back and look on the, on the YouTube. But now I want to take you through a little something else. I want to take you through Moses' prayer. Remember I said I, we, we were going to deal with 12 through 17? I want to so pack you and so arm you with the word. Of the, I want to increase your capacity for the things of God. So now we're going to get into Moses' prayer. And this is, this is something that I do when, when I pray. I, I pray the word of God. And it's simple. So I'm teaching you something right here because you get the word and you just insert yourself. Amen. So we're going to pray what Moses prayed. Father, teach us to number our days and interpret our lives correctly. Set your wisdom deeply in our hearts. Lord, we accept your correction as you chastise those whom you love. Father, help us to discern your compassion in our lives and let the sunrise of your love end my dark night. Send the breaker anointing. Send the breaker anointing into my life that I would break forth into your Kairos moment for me. Father, I declare that only you can satisfy my heart. Father, overwhelm me with joy where I have been overwhelmed with grief. I declare in the name of Jesus that my years of trouble shall be replaced with decades of delight. Hallelujah! Hey! Hallelujah! Come on and rejoice! Come on and rejoice! Come on and rejoice! You owe it to yourself to rejoice! You owe it to God to rejoice. Hallelujah. You just got back in alignment. You just got back into divine alignment. Hallelujah. 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 You're in alignment. You're in alignment. You're in alignment. You're in alignment. Hallelujah. Hi, God. Hi, I agree with God. You just entered a Kairos moment. You just made a pivot. You just made a paradigm shift. Don't let this moment be lost. Hold on to him. Grab hold of him. Apprehend him for the thing that he apprehended you for. Go into glory. Go into the larger place. Go into your large place. Come on, go into your place of promise. Holy, oh, this is your time. This is your time. Don't miss the moment of the season. From this day forward, I declare that it shall be hard for you to get out of alignment. You gotta work real hard to get out of alignment after today. Oh God, Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you, thank you that this word shall be sealed in the heart of your people. That every leaky place in their soul shall be plugged up. I bind the fowls of the air which will come after the word. In the mighty name of Jesus. 
I declare each heart to be good ground for the word of God, that the seed of God will take root and grow and bear fruit and remain according to your word. I call everybody into, I call your church, oh God, into purpose. I call them into alignment. I call them into agreement with you. That we would apprehend what is ours in the spirit and we would see manifestation in the natural. And we will walk in it for we are a people of purpose. Now, is there anyone who wants to come into this faith and, wants, and, and says, you know what, I'm out of alignment because I don't even know this Jesus that you're talking about. If that's you, come. If that's you, come. If that's you, come. If you're out of fellowship and don't have a church home and you want to be connected with this body, if that's you, come. If that's you, come. You're already saved, but you want to be connected. You don't want to be floating around by yourself. You want to be connected to a body of believers, a community. Because if you're saved, you're already connected to the body. But you want to be in a community where you can grow and develop, get in alignment, come. Because you know, isolation is a tool of the devil as well. You can't be saved by yourself. Amen, amen. To God be the glory. Y'all be blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. All right. We're going to do a benediction. We're going to send you on your way blessed. Father, we thank you for your people. We thank you for the word that they have heard, the word that they have believed, and the word that they have received. God, we thank you for teaching us how to number our days, that we would apply your wisdom to our hearts. And we give you glory, O oh God, because you are the one who does exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So I send you out blessed in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah.